Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Roxanne Durhaj of the Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks so much for tuning in again this week. Uh, today, I have a special guest, Jerry Udelson, and I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, Jerry. You did. Okay, so Jerry is out in uh, Carlsbad, California, and he's joining us today uh, to share some of his wisdom about, um, he's a leader in green building, building movement. He's the author of 12 professional books on Green building, sustain, sustainability development, water conservation, green homes, building performance, and green marketing. His book, The Godfather of Green, an eco spiritual memoir, will be published on Earth Day, April 22nd. That's, so that's coming up. Um, and as a young environmentalist, he meets a, a powerful Indian spiritual master who shows him a serious practice of meditation and mindfulness that can work hand in hand with protecting the planet. Something that we are dearly in need of, obviously, Jerry. Uh, what a timely time to be talking to you today. The master's message is simple. Change yourself before you try to change the world. And because oftentimes, what do we think? That, you know, we can't make a lot of a difference. Small things matter. Jerry takes his message on to heart and strives to incorporate this into his busy life as an environmental activist, teacher, and business leader. So again, uh, welcome, Jerry. So, so this path... So I'm going to assume that you started on this path a very long time ago before people started to look at um, the ecosystem or the green movement. Um, today, in today's day and age, it's something that people think about a lot. When did you start in that movement and what got you started in this movement? Well, it's funny. The original environmental movement had a spiritual component. And it, it really, in the U.S., traced us back 100 years or more uh, to John Muir and some of the early conservationists who treated nature as a cathedral. And their experience of being in nature was spiritual for them. And so that kind of an undercurrent uh, was always part of the environmental movement. Um, and then so when that burst onto the scene 50 years ago as in the first Earth Day. Um, there was uh, obviously a group of people who were very political in their orientation, but there was also this subculture of spiritual uh, activity and a realization that we had treated the Earth not like a mother, but like a garbage dump. Mm -hmm. And that realization has always been there. It's been there with indigenous people um, forever. Um, but at the same time, and particularly where I was living then in Northern California, there was a very strong consciousness raising movement that um, came about through the work of people like Ramdas, who died recently. Mm -hmm. um, the S training was a big deal in the 70s, training you to somehow get beyond your normal awareness into something deeper. And so I began to imbibe that. I, I like to say I, I snacked at the spiritual smorgasbord in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. But I didn't take any of it in for me. You know, I was still searching. And then about four years after Earth Day, uh, somebody told me, well, you should go see this visiting guru um, who was in the Bay Area then, uh, he has good energy. So, well, that's a, that sounds okay. <laughs> I've got nothing to lose. So I went to see him. His name was Swami Muktananda, Baba Muktananda. And I was immediately drawn to him, mesmerized. Couldn't take my eyes off of him. There was somebody I had met who all of a sudden was completely natural, completely spontaneous, 
and yet enormously powerful. Mm. And so at that time, I was 30 years old, I began to follow him. And he used to always say, you know, see if something happens for you. Don't follow me. Mm. See if something happens for you, and then you can decide what you want to do. And so after a year or so, I decided, well, this is the right path for me. This is the right practice. I was having intense meditation experiences, um, lots of inner revelations, really starting to unwind that ball of yarn that we all carry, that we've been working on ever since we were born. Right. And to get something, to make something new, you have to undo that whole pattern that's been created, put the yarn back in a ball and start again. And so I think this practice of unwinding um, is, is the same for all of us, but with his help, I was able, let's say, to start attenuating things that weren't working for me and start building new practices that were more in tune with the idea of seeing everyone with love. Mm. And that was his core message, you know? Everything, as Ram Dass used to say, the whole world is just God in drag. God in drag, I love that. <laughs> so everywhere you look, why not see the highest? Mm -hmm. Why see somebody else other, as other than yourself? Why see them as not the highest? awareness because after all it's coming from you mm -hmm. so i began to and then I, i'm working this whole time and i realized that i had to i couldn't have like a work life that was based on um, competition and differentiation and always striving to get on top of somebody else and it's what i would call an old samskara right an old tendency which is to compete mm -hmm. because that's what i had learned my whole life and so at some point I had to face up to bringing this inner practice and inner awareness into my outer world. And so that's what the book is about. It's about struggles to come clean, so to speak, with myself. Which is what I think of most people. Think of the time that we're in right now, Jerry. And, you know, people are struggling with the very thing you're talking about. So, you know, we think of, we hear about people in this, uh, you know, COVID-19, people are afraid to slow because we are, we are um, mesmerized by busyness because that's all we know, because that, to your point, keeps us, that keeps that yarn really, really tangled. Something that familiarity around uh, busyness and craziness is something that we strive off in today's society. Sure. And, and as, as I like to say, the most important thing right now is to share your love and not your fear mm -hmm. with others. And you don't have to go out and, and you can't embrace everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, we, no. have, we now have to have a six foot embrace uh, distance, <laughs> but it's just the way you are that people will pick up on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the essence of any, spiritual path, any spiritual practice, um, is life is a come as you are party. Mm -hmm. We used to have these when I was a kid, a teenager, people would call you on the phone all of a sudden and say, we're having a party, come as you are. <laughs> and so you would just show up. And if you were in jeans, you were in jeans. And if you were in pajamas, you'd put on an overcoat and come in your pajamas. So that was the come as you are party. And that's really what life is. And so how you are is what people get. In fact, I think in Malcolm Gladwell's book, I think it was Blink, he talks about how most people size up everybody in eight seconds or less. He did, yes. And you realize that that's what you do too. And you get a sense of somebody just seeing um, how they walk mm -hmm. and how they look at the world and how much wonderment is in their gaze. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you have to offer, your love and not your fear. 
in a time when so many are fearful. Absolutely. And it's laden, right? Because you see the fear like, you know, the over shopping and, and like, what am I going to do once, you know, I'm, I'm going to be stuck in the, my home with my children and my partner and people are freaking out about what are they going to do, right? So that whole concept that everybody's kind of buying into the fear versus saying, what an opportunity. Like, if you think about it, to some degree, okay, unfortunately, we none of us want to be going through what we're going through right now. But the opportunity to be able to slow down or to maybe read a, that book that you maybe wanted to for a long time, or maybe spend some time with your children because everybody's always so busy versus looking at it as a gift to be able to explore. Most people are freaking out because they're thinking, oh my goodness, what am I, what am I supposed to do with this, all this downtime? Which in my opinion, as a mental health specialist, I think what a gift that you're, that you're giving yourself, you're giving your kids or maybe you're giving your partner, even though I know you're juggling a lot of things at home. Well, you know, the essence of a meditation practice is learning to be with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if you've done this over time, you begin to realize how to be with yourself, no matter what you're doing, how active you are. But in this time, it's an interesting exercise to think about well, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And um, I have a friend in Los Angeles, and he, he said, I, I went to a course you taught once. I said, really? And he says, yes, it was in the mid-80s. Um, and it was called, live each day as if you're, it will be your last, mm -hmm. because one day it surely will. And he said, I always remember that title. And I said, I don't even remember the course, but <laughs> it, it is the truth of our lives is you never know what tomorrow will bring. And in fact, you can only live in the present moment. You can only live right now. The rest, the past is gone. The future is yet to arrive. It's just a projection anyway. So why not just do what you have to do today? And you know, there's a, um, this is what I learned from my teacher, and there's a famous um, rabbi in the, in the Hasidic tradition, the Baal Shem Tov, who was a teacher in, I think, 17th century Poland, and a, a great being. And if you ever want to read great stories about a spiritual master, Baal Shem Tov. So people used to say about him, I don't go there to listen to what he has to say, I go there to watch how he ties his shoes. Mm. Because in the most ordinary activity, you can find everything. And so that, to me, is if you want to do something fun, have a hummingbird feeder. Mm. And just watch how a bird approaches a feeder. Mm. Um, that will slow you down. And I think the key of the time we have now is while you can't go to bars and restaurants, you're still allowed to be out in nature. Isn't that amazing? Because truly we can go out, we can go out and walk every day. Like I back onto the woods here, those types of things. But I would begin given the opportunity to be able to do this through a time that's, you know, less than ideal, but we have this time now, but most people aren't thinking of that as the option to be able to get outside. Well, I think even in Canada, it's spring, officially spring on Thursday or something. Right, um, right. You know, it's, you know, you know that you should do that. Um, I take a long walk every day. Uh, it's just nature's times table is different mm -hmm. than ours. And so you begin to learn how to listen, you begin to learn how to see differently. And if you can really slow yourself down enough, you might learn something. So let's talk a little bit about meditation and mindfulness and how to use it in your busy life. Because I, I can tell you as a, a psychotherapist, as a coach, um, that most people find it difficult, right? They, they find it difficult. You're talking about mindfulness, you know, having a cup of tea and sitting there or watching a hummingbird. And most people are so hypervigilant that they're not able to slow their mind. Like even if I will say to someone, okay, let's take a little couple of minutes. I'm going to, you know, let's go through a guided meditation. Most people will say, uh, like I have a hamster running around in my head. 
So what kind of tips would you say, like for the average person that's maybe listening and say, okay, Jerry, this is a nice concept. <laughs> I'd like to try this, but I've tried this many a times and I'm, I can't slow my mind. What, what little steps would you suggest that people start to try? You know, one of my favorite slogans is, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> Which is the opposite of what your mother probably used to tell you, or right. your father. Um, you know, the easiest thing to do is just to watch the breath. Mm -hmm. You know, Baba used to say, we, we breathe 21,600 times a day. So there's all of these opportunities to just watch your own breath. And then the meditation technique is you begin to, as you start to do that, things do slow down. Mm -hmm. And then you start to look for the space between each in-breath and each out-breath. And in that space, you can find perfect rest. Mm -hmm. So that is that essential meditation technique. It's been taught since forever. The hard part is, how do I get there? And I think for some people, it's mu music. Mm -hmm. Some people might be more visual, and so images of nature can take you to that place, even if you're not outdoors. Right. Um, and you can't be outdoors for whatever reason. Um, being with something that moves you, which, which might be a, a cup of tea, if you're Japanese. <laughs> um, so that whole idea is watching the mind. Now, I was fortunate because I spent two years with all of the different techniques trying to do that. And then when I met my teacher, he just lived in that state. And all you had to do was just to be around him and you would get into that state. So gradually, I began to learn. And then there's all kinds of techniques. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's many techniques for meditation as there are for anything else. So I think the essence is you are your own coach in this enterprise. So you explore, you find what works for you, you go deeper. And ultimately, what Baba Muktananda used to say is, this is it. You know, I'll give you something to get you started, mm -hmm. but it's your life creation, if you will. And you have to decide that that's what you want to do. Because we can look around at our political leadership, we can look around at our business leadership, and we don't see, for the most part, at least on the outside, these kind of understandings manifest. Now, it doesn't mean they aren't that way at home or they aren't that way truly, but we don't see it. But that's why we go to meditation teachers and spiritual teachers, because you can see more clearly what it is that you need to do. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like in th this time, since you do have a little downtime um, in between all of the video conferences and <laughs> virtual meetings and uh, virtual climate strikes, um, you do have the downtime. You don't have to spend time in traffic. Mm -hmm. going to and from an office and plenty of people are still working of course they're right. delivering our food they're making sure the water supply works they're making sure the electricity and gas works um there are all kinds of people working the garbage pickup here was this morning i'm right. very pleased and happy the landscapers were here yesterday for our development so lots of people are still working but if you're not you do have this golden opportunity so tell me when you started, you know, with your busy life at that point, you started to apply the practice and figure out, like you said, your internal world. How did it shift your busy life? How did it make you look? You said you went from a achieve, achieve, achieve an I perspective to now an internal space. Well, it wasn't overnight. Okay. Um, but I think one thing is that you get a little distance and perspective on what your own motivations are mm -hmm. and what your own fears are, particularly at the beginning of the practice. Um, and I have in the book a, a realization that I found, and it came over and over again over a period of several years, 
of how I was still competing with people, mm. competing to be noticed, competing to uh, be the one that was chosen for this or that activity, um, feeling a little, still a little disjointed with people that, you know, the way I saw it, weren't as realized as I was. Mm -hmm. Until I finally realized one day that maybe they were okay. And it was my outlook, outlook that was flawed. And I think that that came from this internal practice, because again, it's what, what you get is an attenuation of tendencies that you had built your whole life on. And then you start to substitute them with the idea, well, instead of competing with somebody, why don't I just try to do my best? Mm. And let the chips fall where they may. Maybe people will notice, maybe they won't. So I would think that that would create a lot more alignment for you for the right kind of projects that you must have taken on. Because I'm thinking, you know, I've, I've sat in rooms, I speak, I train sometimes, and I look at people and you can see the egos sometimes when you've adopted that kind of the watching mentality where you can see people just kind of trying to be noticed. And it's almost like mentally or, or psychologically, they're trying to climb over each other with their words or they want to be recognized. So I'm going to assume with this practice, you're just kind of stepping back and whoever needs to be aligned with you just becomes aligned with you. And the things that don't align just aren't meant to be. Is that the perspective that you start to take? Well, well, sure, because there is a, a sense in meditation of watching. In fact, I used to give a name for the whole practice is watching and waiting. Mm -hmm. You're just watching what happens with mm -hmm. the mind, with the emotions, etc. And you're waiting for the grace of your practice to reveal things to you. Mm -hmm. So watching and waiting. And and then taking that out into your busy life, as it were, um, you begin to see, as you said, suggested, people's motivations, etc. So there's a willingness to let people be who they are. Yeah. A letting go of having to be the best in the room. And then seeing where you can make a contribution. Mm. And I used to have this uh, mental exercise when I was working um, in engineering firms in the green building area, I would go into a work day thinking, well, what, can, what value can I bring today? Mm. And at the end of the work day, I would do a, a quick little assessment. Well, what value have I created today? Mm. And I think if you bring the sense of offering, if you bring the sense of being willing to do whatever it takes to help other people, do what they need to do, then people naturally begin to see you as somebody they can trust, as somebody they can rely on, and maybe as somebody who has a different enough perspective that they can bring some clarity to a situation. And so and I, would, me, I, I, and I And I would think that certain people would be drawn to that because clearly what I hear, Jerry, it's about service. If I am able to delay I, I think from a neuroscience perspective as a, as with what i do it's almost like people get caught up in the whole you know spring of things and they get you know either catapulted to the past or they're worrying about the future and that present they don't stay there very long and on that space um they get caught up to the moment and ego gets involved. But when you're able to be the watcher, what you're able to do is be more of service, which is clearly what you're saying. If you're in a room where people could just experience you for what you bring, eventually the people that need to be drawn to you will, and the people that aren't meant to be aligned with you just kind of fade off. Would you say that that has happened to you in your, on your career path? Yeah. I have a friend who's, who uh, does a lot of work uh, with leaders of organizations. And uh, she wrote a nice little book called To Lead is to Serve. And this concept of servant leadership obviously mm -hmm. is out there. Yes. Um, it's hard to remove your ego from the situation, no matter who you are. But the idea of offering what Baba used to call selfless service is the essence of any spiritual path. And it's the essence of your domestic life. I mean, 
how far will you get as a husband if you sit around all the time waiting for the spouse to serve you? Mm. And I think, I think we all learn in our family life and in our uh, outside the workplace life about service, then to bring it into the workplace life is more challenging mm -hmm. because not everybody recognizes it and you right. have to be okay with that. Right. But the idea of servant leadership is probably one of the biggest innovations in thinking in the last 50 years. It's, it's never been absent, but it certainly got um, submerged in our culture, particularly our North American culture, Western culture, with the idea of the dominant entrepreneur, mm -hmm. the, the dominant personality, the winner takes all um, idea. And we were forgetting that in life, it's a different game. Mm -hmm. And there is no one keeping score. And there's no one deciding who's a winner or a loser because ultimately as actors in this play we all have to exit stage left <laughs> and so at that point it's too late to figure it out this time around so to speak um so why not get started now so let's talk a little bit about uh you know our relationship to the planet and for leaders or just like you're talking about whether you're leaving, leading at home, you're leading a corporation or you're leading a community kind of um, movement, that alignment between us being connected to nature and leadership, there's, there's a link there that we need to make more often to be able to serve better. So how do we make that link and what kind of things do you think we should be doing in our lives to be able to be more connected to the planet? You know, one of the um, aspects of the environmental movement was the wilderness movement. Mm -hmm. And the idea that some things should just be left alone. It's very hard for human beings to understand or to grasp because we are the dominant species. We're in the process of changing the climate of the whole planet. Think about that. No other species that we know of has ever done this. And we're then responsible for results. But the idea, every time I see an advertisement for a cruise ship to Antarctica, I cringe. Mm. Because you're going to leave pollution behind. Right. There's going to be a ship that gets in distress there's going to be a ship that goes aground on an iceberg and spills oil. Mm -hmm. There's all of that activity. And so the idea that we should leave some things alone is essential to the thinking. And so we have this movement now of rewilding North America. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, re we're depopulating our prairies. And I yes. suspect when the oil boom ends, Canada will depopulate its prairies. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just take down the fences and let the buffalo roam, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 100 years out, maybe 50 years out. But the idea of being willing to respect your home and having a, a broader sense of home. And so the science of ecology developed in the last 50 to 75 years as the study of our broader household. And if you think about it, Gary Snyder, the poet, uh, it's a prize winning poet, wrote a, a, a book once called Earth Household or mm -hmm. Earth Household. Right. <laughs> and the whole idea was to really reconceive our whole idea of relationship to the Earth House. Well, the first thing you want to do if you're in your own house is you can't leave the garbage all around. Mm -hmm. You have to keep it clean, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not even that far along yet. So I, I just wrote a blog post about, you know, what we can learn from Earth Day and apply to the climate crisis. And one of the things that we can learn is that we have to stop doing certain things. And the old saying that takes five miles for an oil tanker to stop before you can turn it around, mm -hmm. um, and it probably does. 
because that's 25,000 feet, 8,000 meters. Um, it does take a while to stop a big ship. So to stop this forward momentum towards planetary destruction and destruction of our own livelihoods is really the first step in the environmental movement. And the first step in the climate change movement is to stop doing some things. And as one of the uh, leading proponents, Bill McKibben says, it's okay to leave it in the ground. <laughs> Just because it's a resource and it's there doesn't mean that we have to encourage people to take it. So this whole notion of being willing to live within limits, being willing to live, and, and the limits are only like physical. There's no limit on our imagination. Mm -hmm. There's no limit on our ability to communicate with ourselves, with the planet, with the higher, higher selves. None of that's limited. We just have to somehow figure out how to say, well, we're not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And then it comes down to something really basic like combustion. I mean, the entire industrial revolution was built on the steam engine, mm -hmm. which is built on combustion, right? Taking coal and burning it and making hot steam and using that to drive a motor, right? That's the, the essence. And and then, my God, we got enough left over that we can drain the mine so that we can mine more of this stuff. So right. the minute they got engines and pumps that could pump water out of deeper and deeper mines, they were able to go further down. Mm. And so that's the history of the last 250 years encapsulated has been combustion. Well, when you move to a renewable energy economy, you make electricity directly from the sun, from the wind, from falling mm -hmm. water. Like where you live, it's almost all based on hydropower. It is, yes. Nature has gifted Canada with a lot of snow and rain yeah. and, and enough elevation changes to make dams and hydropower. Um, all of a sudden we begin to say, well, gee, this was pretty crude. Uh, I'm an engineer by training. And if you actually look at an automobile, it gets about 10% of the, energy in the fuel converted to going forward okay the rest is wasted mm. as heat that's pretty primitive don't you think well for sure and our electric power system is maybe 20 percent efficient by the time you go from burning something to where you're using something like a coffee maker mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 80 percent is wasted so we really haven't been very good at this and so i think psychologically the, the the real issue now is well can we take a path that's different that isn't on the surface as easy but which has all of these longer term benefits like not flooding everywhere along the coast right i mean 40 percent of u.s population lives in coastal counties mm. which are going to be inundated at least at the edges with rising seas. We already know that. It's already baked in for the next 300 years. There's nothing we can do at this point other than somehow magically figure out how to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, we're going to have to live with that. And it's not we, not you and me, it's the, those who come after us. Right. So then we come back to this sort of basic spiritual wisdom of indigenous people. The seventh generation philosophy right live as if what you were creating was going to benefit people seven generations in the future right and then would you do things differently and the answer is of course so we're beginning to get that we're beginning to see well why don't i buy stuff that's sustainably sourced whatever that might mean mm. that doesn't degrade the planet and then why don't I figure out a way to reuse it or repurpose it so it doesn't just get tossed away or right. as plastic wind up in the ocean, killing all kinds of creatures. Of course, of course. So this sort of coming into awareness is humanity wide. It's difficult because so many people are just beginning to enjoy the fruits, so to speak, of modern life. Uh, two-thirds of us now live in cities. 
-hmm. or we will shortly. Um, and that's a bigger issue because we are, in essence, disconnected from nature by the virtue of living in cities. We don't see the rhythms and the cycles. If we read about it, we wouldn't even understand it. Mm -hmm. If you um, haven't experienced it, it would be hard to, it would be hard to, to know what it would be like. Now for any, the average person out there that's thinking about, you know, how do we wrap this all together? How do I make, how do I make a difference, right? We talk about, you know, being centered you to your point and going out there and thinking of my actions, how I could help the planet. So what, what is the, you know, the average person says, how am I going to make a difference? I think the ess essence is start with something, something that's clearly doable. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't recycle, well, start recycling. Mm -hmm. I know Canada was very successful with the, the, the blue bin. Mm -hmm. for recycling right so there was yes. peer pressure if you didn't yes. see a blue bin in front of your neighbor's <laughs> house you they weren't being a good citizen yes. to them. yeah or once you got to a certain critical mass everybody everyone said well i guess i better put out a blue bin even if there's nothing in it <laughs> and then and then your children would start to tell you well why are you being so uh, hypocritical put something in it so there are all kinds i mean I still, even though I live in a small townhouse, I still grow tomatoes, cucumbers, and lettuce every year in mm -hmm. barrels. Yes, yes. You can do that. You can, you can grow uh, kitchen herbs in an apartment balcony, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everyone has their own way of doing things. Um, and I think it's, it's important that we don't share our guilt with people, but to share our our best side and right. I think so I think the essence of any environmental response is first become aware and then do what you can do where you are with what you've got and you know it's in it's the poorest people in the world who do the most sharing mm -hmm. and I think that's a great lesson and there's people everywhere who can learn from nothing mm -hmm. one of the great books I read recently was a short book called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind mm -hmm. about a young boy in Malawi who didn't even have enough money to go to school, but he could read. And he found an old book in a library on electricity. And he taught himself electricity. And then he decided because he wanted to read at night and he didn't have electricity, that he would make a wind turbine mm. with scrap. Wow. And to make a long story short, he eventually became the subject of a TED talk and was offered a scholarship at a US Ivy League school and was smart enough to do all this stuff. So we have wisdom, every one of us, just by virtue of being human beings, that we can apply to situations once we decide it's something we want to do. And that wisdom deepens when you spend time with yourself in a practice like meditation, mindfulness. And with that deeper wisdom, you can then offer more to other people. So if you want to do selfless service, start with the self, mm -hmm. the big self, get acquainted with it, right. and then get rid of that little self in the selfless service um, and do what you can. I mean, for some people, it might just be what people are doing right now on our little, uh, we have a kind of a neighborhood internet, maybe there's 3,000 people. It's a, a, a website called Next Door, mm -hmm. and it's all around. And people just say, well, if anyone needs someone to go shopping for them, I'm available. Right, right. That, that's simple. You don't know if anyone does, but you're offering. Right and you're sincere about it. And if you get called by 10 people, you're gonna not say, well, I can't do 10 people. You're gonna recruit nine friends mm -hmm. to do the same. So since we're all at home, we can all be at service now to those around us who need something. 
to make the difference now. Now, I, I know we could probably talk a whole lot more about this, and this has been very You're a, psychothera you're a psychotherapist. You're, you're, you've got me talking. <laughs> I I'm did, really and I I'm love really it. Through a couch. <laughs> I would love for you to tell people about, so the book is um, Godfather of Green, an Echo, Echo Spiritual Memoir, and that's coming out on Earth Day on April 22nd. Tell people where they can get a hold of the book and if they wanted to chat further with you, how they can connect with you uh, just for more of this information, Jerry. So I have a website for the book. It's called jerryudelson.net. Um, the book is available now for pre-order on any online source. Um, there are some nice ones out there. One is called Indie Books that allows you to order from your local bookstore if they're subscribed to that service. So you don't have to order from Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, but you, and there's an ebook and a paperback. Um, and if you've got all of these uh, long nights at home, what better than to read? Get, Jerry's, get Jerry's book and start reading it. So no, Jerry I wouldn't say that, you know, a lot of people have told me um, they couldn't stop reading it. And I don't know what that might indicate about their mental state. <laughs> but, um, it, it's a story of how I struggled to bring these two worlds together. Okay. And that's the essence of it. And then how that became a springboard to doing other things. It has poems, contemplations, um, meditation experiences uh, really opened up. And for me, it was a process truly of opening up and remembering things that I had not thought about in a long, long time. So I had to dig deep to be able to tell a story that I thought would interest other people. And so far the feedback has been very nice. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. What, what's my takeaway? My takeaway is um, in order to get connected to the bigger me, uh, to take the time and to get outside as much as I can, because I, I like everybody else, Jerry, a time is guilty and I'm looking outside and I have a lot of green, but sometimes what happens is I get up and I start working at eight and sometimes I take little breaks, but I don't get outside. So I think just to be able to go in, go out, breathe, get connected, even if it's a short walk around the block to try to do that as much as possible, or even just to go back to that basic breath which we oftentimes don't take those small snippets of time through our day to be able to, to kind of rejuvenate ourselves and get regrounded. So thank you so much again. Um, all the information on Jerry's website and where you can get the book will be in the show notes. Uh, for everyone, thanks again for listening in. This is Roxanne Durhodge of Authentic Living with Roxanne. As you know, I'm a mental health and wellness specialist. I speak and train and consult. And so if you're needing any further information on me, you can go to my website at roxannedurhodge.com. Take care and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxannederhage.com slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.